morning and welcome to Shattering Abyss, the program that has been devoted to those of you who are open to the realization that the human institutions that present themselves as in control, as trustworthy, as providing a service, defending your freedom, protecting you, giving you opportunity and hope, are universally corrupt. That every religious, every religious organization, every political institution, every military, every media outlet, they're not only corrupt, they're counterproductive. And while that's a statement of fact, and we have devoted years of this program to proving it, it is far more important for you to recognize that it's not just that the U.S. government, for example, is wholly dishonest and counterproductive. And that the U.S. military is counterproductive. And that the FBI and CIA are grotesquely inappropriate and immoral, untrustworthy. It's that God is hateful of these institutions. He despises them. And that God's not going to spend eternity with something that he finds objectionable. And therefore, if you are going to cling to these things, if you're going to participate in them, if you're going to vote, if you're going to support the military, oh, join the military, if you're going to identify yourself with a political party, if you're going to go to a religious service, go to church, define yourself by your faith, then so long as you continue to do these things, you have a 0% possibility of coming to know who God is. You have no chance whatsoever of engaging in a relationship with him. And if you do not act upon the terms and conditions of his relationship agreement, you cannot and will not be saved by him. Now, those are all statements of fact. It's not my opinion. It's not my interpretation. That's what Yahweh says. Yahweh happens to be God's one and only name. And if you would like to know him, there's only one way you can do that. What do you think that might be, Kirk? Uh, study the Torah. Study his word. All right. Now, when you say Torah, are you defining um, the first five books of what uh, Christians would call the Old Testament of their Bible, or is Torah a broader term than that? No, you, you also have the, uh, the prophets and Psalms. That's still God speaking. But isn't uh, the Torah inclusive of the prophets and Psalms? Can I just say, yeah, it was Torah, and, uh, and that would incorporate all of it? It, it does to me. There are people who want to fight over this only the first five books, but... What does the word Torah mean? Torah means teaching, and he's never stopped teaching, so... Is there guidance in the in the uh, Psalms? Yeah, it tells you exactly how to read the Torah, how yeah. to uh, approach the Torah. How to... Yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, this proverb that we've been studying, is there guidance in it on how we should uh, act? Tremendous. In fact, the entire thing is written to be guidance, isn't it? Right, right. In fact, is there Torah... In the proverb, did we stumble across the word Torah in this proverb? Yes. So if there's Torah teaching in this proverb, then if we were to say Torah, it would be inclusive of the proverbs. Yeah. We, could, we can include the uh, sayings of Yahushua. The trouble is we just don't have them in, in a really good form because yeah. they burned them all. Yeah, they've been uh, uh, poorly remembered. They've been uh, translated from Hebrew to, uh, to Greek. And then, uh, and then they substantially um, uh, molested, if you will, by religious people, and then very poorly translated out of Greek to English. Now, um, you already mentioned that the Psalms focus on, and there are many Psalms, including the longest Psalm, the 119th, it focuses entirely on Torah. So the Psalms would be Torah. Uh, do you think that the word Torah appears in the Prophets? Yeah, throughout them. 
Yep. So uh, if you just say Torah, you are inclusive of the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms. If you were to say Prophets and not add uh, Torah, would you also be inclusive of all of the testimony that Yahweh has provided? Sure, because there's prophecy all through from Genesis uh, 4. Correct. Yeah. In fact, the creation account is, is both prophetic. historic and prophetic. It, uh, it outlines not only the 7,000-year increments of human history that would transpass uh, uh, Where we are. from yeah from the uh, the time of Eden all the way to um, the seventh a thousand year period which will begin in on our pagan calendars in 2033 it is prophetic of, of the future As a matter of fact it's it's extraordinarily prophetic of the most important millennial period which is the fourth millennium of human history where it says that on the fourth day the greater light will become visible to us as a sign of the meetings, <laughs> which is profound because in the 4th century CE, um, 33 CE is when uh, Yosha became visible to us, uh, actually he became visible in, uh, at, on Sukkoth, God camping out with us in uh, 2 BCE and, uh, and fulfilled the first four Mikre in the fourth millennium of human history in 33 CE year 4,000, you know, exactly as the Genesis Barashid account predicted. So if I were to say prophets, the Torah has prophecy. The uh, uh, Proverbs, so this proverb that we're studying is prophetic of, uh, of Paul. Uh, and uh, the Psalms are filled with prophecy. In fact, two of the most amazing Psalms, 22 and 88, actually, or the, provide the best eyewitness account of what would happen on Pesach, Matzah, Bakudim, and Shavuah in 33 CE. And they were written a thousand years before. Right. Uh, uh, vivid on the crucifixion, vivid on what would happen on Matzah and Sheol, and, uh, and vivid on, uh, on the basis of Bakudim, uh, where the eyewitness accounts uh, are pathetically inept on most of them. Okay. Yeah, so... Uh, I, when Yosha was talking about, uh, you know, do not think that, uh, you know, I came to annul the Torah and prophets, uh, but I came to, uh, because I came to fulfill it. Um, he referred to the Torah and prophets as a singular thing. Not like there are Torah and then there's prophets. Because God's mark, his proof that he has um, um, authorized something. I mean, it, God tells you that the single most important thing you should look for as to whether or not I inspired words, whether or not you can trust that they came from me, right. is both precisely accurate history and prophecy. Now, I, I, just like Torah and Prophets, I could just say precisely accurate history and be comprehensive. Yes. Because from Yahweh's point of view, history is simply history. It doesn't matter if that history is in our past uh, or in the uh, future of those he was giving it to. And from the context of the one who's authoring this, um, all, all of it is in front of him, I mean, right before him. I think. Right, right before him. So uh, precisely accurate history is, uh, is actually the, uh, the test because from Yahweh's perspective, there, it's, all of it plays out right before him, uh, there is no past, present, and future, just like the Hebrew language with no past, present, and future. And so whether it is future history or past history or our present, that is his primary signature. So everything that he has inspired contains prophecy, without exception. Correct. Oh, by the way, which uh, there are 13 letters in the, uh, this, the so-called Christian New Testament do you know which um, have uh, uh, no, only one prediction, only one prophecy in all 13 of them, and uh, that one was uh, wrong? Who, who uh, disqualified himself uh, speaking from Yahweh because he contained no accurate prophecies? Well, according to Dabarim, that would be Paul. That would be Paul, yeah. Paul only made one prophecy in his life. It was about uh, the thing that he called the rapture um, from Harpazo. It's a vicious snatching away. And he said that it would occur during his lifetime. Mm -hmm. Sorry, pal. Got it, got it wrong. Uh, 
And so, uh, if we were just to say Torah, we would include everything because there's, in, in fact, when I was writing Yada Yada, which was a book um, devoted entirely to uh, prophecy, I wanted to use prophecy to demonstrate absolutely that uh, God exists and that you can come to know him. And so I figured I'd use prophecy because you can't get everything throughout human history, including things that have yet to unfold but are unfolding before our eyes, correct, unless uh, you uh, exist outside of the confines of time. For example, he actually predicted in 700 uh, BCE that the, that the last battle to be waged before the tribulation would begin would be in Syria. Yes. And that it would ultimately uh, uh, cause the Syrian government to fall and Damascus to be left in a heap of ruins and that the immediate consequence of that would be forcing Israel to forfeit uh, Judea and Samaria, what's called the West Bank. Right. How do you do on that prediction? Uh, it's, it is a remarkable read. I have it uh, laying just ahead of me a little bit. So. Yeah, it is. It's a remarkable read. So here you um, you have Yahweh's testimony. It's called uh, Torah and Prophets as in a singular entity. The Torah, Yahweh's guidance and teaching, is always filled with prophecy so that you can trust the uh, the author. And the uh, his prophecy is all filled with teaching. As I was saying, as I studied Yahweh's prophecies, what I found is that while the predictions were always interesting and provided proof of God's existence and his authorship, you very, sell, very soon after doing that, you just you become a bit numb to mm-hmm. the proofs. Right. And I'm just numb to them because uh, it's, it's like, for example, uh, me, if I were to... Um, uh, to I hit my uh, my hand with a hammer uh, to prove that I was still alive and I could feel pain. About the tenth time I did that, I said, you know, this is probably redundant. Mm-hmm. Uh, after you've come to ex- experience the profound nature of these prophecies, uh, the proofs that Yahweh authored his um, Torah prophets and Psalms, and after a while, it's it's like, saying, okay, you know, I get it already. Uh, it's it's overwhelming, it's conclusive, it's undeniable. This idea that, you know, I'll uh, believe in God when he when he proves his existence. You know, no one can prove his existence. Well, he proved his existence. He can. Yeah, he can, and he did. And after a while, it's so, you know, it's... It's overwhelming. You, it's overwhelming. You just continue to gild the, uh, the lily. And, and I uh, finally, what I uh, did is that I found the guidance that was associated with those predictions to be vastly more stimulating and useful. Uh, as God says, his Torah is for rational discourse. Uh, it's the path and the way of lives and for rational discourse about being right. I found the rational discourse about being right and, how, and the way of life vastly more stimulating mm-hmm. than the proofs that Yahweh you know, existed. But... But that's not how it started off. It started off, I was most excited about the proofs. Well, you also came out of a frame of a whole generation going, uh, God's dead. They couldn't figure out who killed him. Mm-hmm. God's dead. Yeah. yeah. Then exists, yeah. and yeah. secular humanism took off, you know. So. Yeah, and secular humanism even took off with this notion that uh, that the only reason that religion exists is that uh, is that science can't prove Mm-hmm. Uh, that, uh, or that, uh, you know, that this Thanks science would come to say, you can't confuse, you, your, your justification is that we can't state what started it. We can explain how it started, but we can't go beyond the, uh, the start of the universe. And, and so the lame, uh, will just say, well, that was God. And, and no. God proves his existence, even on creation. Yes. He, uh, he not only tells us exactly how the universe was created, that it began with a big explosion, he, he coined the term Big Bang, and that, uh, uh, that energy, light, finally, uh, uh, in an expansive period, cooled to the point that it was able to coalesce into matter. And that is the, the moment that light coalesced into matter 
time as we know it starts to flow. Prior to that, the universe could be any number of, uh, of periods yeah. old. We just can't measure. We can only measure time from the moment matter exists because time doesn't flow. And, uh, and, and when everything is just energy-based, there is no such concept as time. Time doesn't even is not, not even a concept that's, that's relevant when it's strictly uh, light. So Yahweh tells us that that's what he did and talks us about the expansive nature of it and then walks us through each of the subsequent events that led to the universe as we know it and life as we know it, every time precisely accurate. And he then tells us that he did it in six 24-hour days. And what you find is that six 24-hour days, based upon the, the um, stretching of time that we measure as part of the, the, uh, the radiation from the Big Bang, which is 2.73 Kelvin, and we can, we can actually measure how the rate that time flowed at the Big Bang relative to the way that time flows now here on Earth. Yes. And six 24-hour days is like 14 to 15 billion years. Oh, 14 points, yeah. You know, who, who knows what that is. Right, 14 points. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the scientist now will tell you it's, uh, it's 13.8 because of the cosmic microwave background. But as we did a, uh, several programs with Roy, there are three different ways to uh, to um, evaluate that uh, that um, uh, quark confinement and that the that the only one that makes sense now is the is the middle ground which which brings us uh, just shy of, uh, of um, 15 billion years uh, and so if you do the math it's it's exactly what you was said and you know, after a while, you just your jaw drops on your, uh, you know, down to your chest, and you say, "Oh my God, why isn't that proclaimed in every classroom?" Just think how profound that is. Mm-hmm. And it's more profound than than the proof E equals M C squared. It is stunningly profound, and uh, and therefore, why isn't the Torah? Taught is that yeah, this is exactly as it happened. This is science has confirmed that that this three thousand year old, three thousand five hundred year old document is precisely accurate. Well, usually when you find uh, uh, something that valuable that gives you that much information, you would keep digging that hole. You would, and that's what we've done. But they don't they don't do that with the Torah. I mean, yeah, I know that's what we've done. I, was, I had a real scientific mind. I wasn't a hypocrite. I would say, my gosh, what else is in there? Yeah. Scientifically, I just do it from a scientific standpoint. Uh, you know, if you didn't. Yeah. Or the fourth day of creation, where the uh, the greater light becomes visible as a sign for the Moed meetings, and then you look at at year four thousand yeah, it's thirty three CE, mm-hmm. and exactly thirty three CE. It's exactly the year that Yosha fulfilled Pesach, Matzah, Bakunim, and Shabbat, the Moed Mikra. And you and you you look at that and say, oh. <laughs> well, it's just a coincidence. <laughs> pretty good guesser. Yeah, pretty good guesser. Yeah, written, um, you know, 1,500 years before the event and committed to to parchment so that we could, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, find absolute proof of this dating uh, in writing to as much as 250 years before the events that it foretold. Well, I thought it rather profound. There's two things that uh, I thought extremely profound uh, that you've uh, said, uh, talking about these things. One was the understanding that if you were like Einstein, like Einstein, you were quoting Einstein, and mm-hmm. you're sitting on a, you know, on a, uh, on a, let's just say a light particle. You can't do mm-hmm. that. Let's project. Mm-hmm. We could, and then all of a sudden time would stand still because you're running at 186,000 miles per second. And time moves slower, so you would see the beginning and the end, the alpha right. omega, basically. Yeah. So. yeah, as a matter of fact, time does not move. Doesn't move, yeah. yeah time simply exists. Exists right it's, there. It's, yeah, it's not timeless. Um, it's, uh, it's just that the... No, the but you're not in it, time it, anymore. Yeah, right. Your perspective now is up right. here. So that helps yeah. you understand uh, Yahweh mm-hmm. and how he saw the beginning to the end. And he exactly. Knows everything that's happening, and he enters into time. 
uh, diminished capacity, but right. that's how he uh, is able to see everything. Now, right. that, yes. uh, that explains that, prophecy, as a matter of fact. That, his that, his he, prophecy he, is really a not prophecy, he, not yeah. predicting anything. It's, he's simply reporting on future history. Yeah. He's just saying, this is what you all did. Yeah. That's why, by the way, you take predestination out of the equation once you understand light. And, uh, and the nature of Yahweh says, I am light. Mm-hmm. And he says, by the way, his Torah is light, which means Yahweh is his Torah. Yes. Uh, they, by being light, Yahweh is able to see all time. And he can see all time at any time. Therefore, all he is doing is reporting future history uh, to uh, to us before that history occurs. He's not predestining us to, to do it. He's not even predicting it. He's simply reporting what he has witnessed in the future in our past. Exactly. And that's profound. When you and when you understand light, then you understand the ability to do that. Mm-hmm. Now, the, the second thing that uh, you brought up and that I've been thinking about, especially as uh, for some reason this week, uh, is this notion that you keep hearing from um, modern Christianity that everybody should be saved, and and God's going to take us. He can wipe away all our discrepancies. That's not an issue. I mean, mm-hmm. do that. when we turn into light, which is what the goal was, that's what he told Abraham, that's what he told all of us, mm-hmm. um, like him, which is like light, uh, then you are like the, uh, uh, you now can't be destroyed. Correct. You are there. Right. Cannot destroy now, energy. <laughs> now, you bring in your character. I mean, the thing that's, uh, the nature that's, uh, that makes you you will mm-hmm. be there, but of course the, all the other stuff won't because you're going to have the tore in your heart and all that sort of thing. So that's so. If someone comes to that place, mm-hmm. they can't be destroyed. Correct. So why would you take all of this, all these people with all this baggage and all this filth on them that don't want to be there? Right. Why would you? Why would he take them? Of course. Then you have to live with them forever. Right. Not going to do it. But by the way, when he calls the Torah light, mm-hmm. he's saying that the Torah cannot be destroyed. That's true, too. He's also saying that the Torah is more than just words in a book. For indeed, the prescriptions and conditions of the covenant are a lamp illuminated by olive oil. And the Torah is a light. So if the Torah, in fact, it doesn't even say, you know, I have here, uh, um, Torah is a light. It's actually Torah or. And so I've, um, I've actually um, uh, understated what's, uh, what's there. Yeah. Torah, Torah light. light. Torah light. And, and the way that Hebrew works with possessives and, and the light, it really means Torah is light. Torah equates to light. Torah and light are synonymous. Torah and light are, are connected and bound together. Torah light. So if Torah's light, can uh, the Torah have a uh, a can it be limited in uh, in time, as Paul says? No, because that was Paul's big thing. Oh, you know, should the Torah have any value value of the Torah at all? Oh, may it not be. Of course, it has some value. It had a value up to the point of his Jesus Christ. Now that's exactly the opposite of what Yosha said. So he's contradicting him, which makes Paul a complete liar. But Something that is equated to light cannot be limited in time, can it? No, and, and, and consider one other thing. If light is what takes the darkness away, mm-hmm. how could it be uh, pornographic? How could it yeah. be perverted? How could it be anything but... How could it be enslaving? Anything but pure. Right. Yes, but light is, in the presence of light, there is no darkness. There is no darkness. So, so if you want to be appear perfect in Yahweh's eyes, immerse yeah. yourself in the Torah. Immerse yourself in the Torah, and you're going to look like the Torah from Yahweh's point of view. And so rather than the Torah condemning you, the Torah is the thing that enlightens you and thereby eliminates all of your sin, all of your corruption, all of your flaws. Wrapped in the Torah, immersed in the Torah, you look like light. You look just like God. How can anyone make that argument? 
So it can't be limited in time because Torah equals light. It cannot be limited in time. It, and by the way, it, not just the time as we know it, the 7,000 years that human history is playing out from the garden to now, not just the time of the, of the 14 to 15 billion years of, of the universal existence, but before and after. We're talking about before. If it's light, then it existed before the universe existed, and it will exist after the universe. Uh, and and then you, what you have to do is understand that teaching evolves. It doesn't change. It evolves. For example, you uh, teach art class, right. and you start the uh, the art class with. If you've got a class of newbies. You're going to uh, talk to them about very fundamental things, aren't you? Absolutely. Now, uh, if you've got a class that uh, now you're teaching the, the seventh class, and, uh, and you've had 90% of the students, or maybe even all the students, have attended your first six classes, and now they're in for the seventh class, if you were to teach them exactly the same thing in the same way, would there be any benefit to them? No. No. Now, do you have to contradict what you previously said to teach them more things that are applicable once they have come to a tremendous understanding of the basics? As you teach them more, do you have to contradict what you previously said? No, the fundamentals are still the fundamentals, but now you're, you're uh, expanding on that on what you can do with it. Right. And the Torah exists in that way. Right. God's not going to contradict it, but it's going to evolve so that the teaching is applicable to us as we grow. Well, another shading would be if you're going to call the Torah the Word, and you're going mm -hmm. to call Yosha the Word, mm -hmm. and the Torah and Yah are the Word, mm -hmm. that's assuming that he's never going to say anything again. Yeah, as a matter of fact, you know, when, when uh, Yael Conan wrote, and by, by the way, Yael Conan was was actually quoting the uh, the Torah when he said this, because when he said that uh, the uh, that the uh, word became flesh and dwelt among us, by the way, which by the way destroys Pauline Christianity, because in Pauline Christianity the flesh is evil, that would make uh, Yosha evil, that would make the word of of God uh, evil, um, but. Um, uh, the the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and he also said that uh, the light became visible to us. And so he was there. He was citing the uh, Devarim, uh, the Genesis on the fourth day of uh, creation. But he's saying the light and the word became uh, uh, visible to us in uh, Yosha, which makes Yosha both the light and a representation of both the light and the Torah. Mm -hmm. Wow. So uh, uh, you've got, by being light, it's something that, uh, that you can immerse yourself in and appear perfect. So it is the solution to rebellion and not the cause of it. And uh, number two, it is eternal. It has no ability to be limited in time. Uh, it exists forever, therefore, as light. And as light, it's identical to Yahweh, who is light. So why doesn't this resonate with people? I mean, if I'm talking, you know, I, I know, but I know a lot of reasons why they didn't, but I just don't get it. This is yeah. too. Yeah, it's, and, mm -hmm. I mean, just, just, mm -hmm. just to say that uh, you know, is using a metaphor here. Um, you know, the Torah is a light. You know, it, it will enlighten you. You know, that's the way I translated it. I mean, I'm not doing it any justice at all when I translate it like that. And that's like I got I got to one percent. And left the 99% unspoken. When you equate, when this reads Torah or, and you equate Torah with light, then what you're saying is this is an eternal um, uh, document, uh, teach source of teaching that will enlighten you, that will uh, that will cause you to be like light, that will cause you to be like Yahweh. Like your path. Yeah. Those give you directions on which way to go. Okay. Yes. That you can immerse yourself in it and become like it. Because as we are, our, our souls are transformed from occupying a physical, limited, mortal body that decays, our soul will soon 
be embedded in light. Mm-hmm. And the set of heart spirit, she is light. So it's uh, there, when it talks about the Torah of your uh, of your mother earlier in this. Uh, uh, the reason that's the Torah of your mother, and it's uh, it's uh, uh, again Torah and mother are uh, are side by side in that case, is because the set apart spirit is Yahweh's light set apart from Him. Mm-hmm. The Torah is Yahweh's light set apart from Him. Yeah. It's it's not just that the Torah can be enlightened by our, by the set of heart spirit. It's that the Torah and the set of heart spirit are exactly the same. Yes. I, I understand that. So the reason that we are, are enlightened by the set of heart spirit when we're studying the Torah is that the Torah is the set of heart spirit, and the set of heart spirit is the Torah. They are equivalent. You know, this whole idea that Christians, they want to be born again, and, and they have their Holy Spirit, and that's how they're born again. To, to be born anew from above and adopted uh, into Yahweh's family, which is the third um, benefit of, of the, uh, the covenant, which comes to us by way of Bukhutim. Uh As that occurs, we're actually being immersed in the Torah. Well, that was evident when when they spoke afterwards. Uh, right. Days later, yeah. Right. Yeah, that's why he says that the Torah uh, is light, and they, being the covenant and uh, the Torah in which it is presented, are the way of lives. Mm-hmm. And what we're doing right here for rational discourse about being right. You know, if if uh, you um, um, go and decide uh, tomorrow that uh, for giggles you're going to go and steal the toys of, uh, of uh, orphans. Uh, that would be acting badly. But you're immersed in the Torah. From an eternity point of view, you're just fine. Yeah. You might be doing something that's bad, but you will be right with the yeah. other. Uh, so the, the Torah exists so that we can have this kind of a rational discourse and ultimately be right. I'm not, just, I'm not going to scare the little toys. Okay. Uh, and it, by the way, and it doesn't say that uh, that uh, in an argument that Kirk is right or Craig is right or Larry is right or Scott is right. Abraham was declared today. Right. Abraham was declared right. Who declared him right? Yahweh. Yeah. Based on what he asked him to do. Right. Because uh, um, Abram came to understand and the fact that when he was declared Sadak right, it was that Yahweh accounted his now understanding of the inheritance of the covenant is light. That's the time. It, it's, it's an outgrowth of uh, Abraham saying, I don't get what I'm inheriting. Yahweh showed him the spiritual realm of light and then took him to the light of the stars and said, this is what you're inheriting. And then based on Abraham understanding that he was inheriting light, he was, Boy, that considered, was, he was considered right. There's a direct tie in here. Yeah. It's a great connection. Yeah. The moment that, that um, Yahweh provided Abraham with the ability to understand that what he was inheriting was light, then he was considered right. So we are inheriting light. We are inheriting the Torah. You know, when Yahweh said he gave his Torah to Abraham, mm-hmm. the moment he showed Abraham that he would be transformed into light, he gave him his Torah. Or, yeah, Torah is or. Yeah. A direct correlation here. They, and so the point was, it's not about you and I being right about some issue. Mm-hmm. It's about Yahweh being right. And when we agree with him, when we accept what 
his perspective, when we accept his offer, when we accept his conditions, when we accept his approach and perspective, that makes us right because we're accepting the fact that he is right. Yes. That makes it totally So we become right by acknowledging that Yahweh was right. Mm-hmm. Now, that doesn't sound like a, a big leap that this God who proves himself through history, uh, accepting that this God who proves himself through history, that he is light and therefore exists outside of the confines of time, is right. You know, to say that the creator of the universe who conceived the entire universe and the life within it is responsible for your life is right, that's not a, a big leap of faith, is it? In fact, there's no faith involved. No. That's provable. Why wouldn't everyone on the planet come to accept that the individual who proves that he is the creator and the, of the universe and the author of life and that he inspired his Torah teaching, why wouldn't everyone on the planet acknowledge that he's right? Well, that is the $64,000 question, isn't it? Because everybody, I can find 7 billion people that will say he's not. Yeah, you can. Yeah, they just yeah, you can. No? Yeah, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. I, I'm, 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 I'm sure, yeah. yeah. I, you know, uh, socialist secular guys are right. Mao was right. You know, they yeah. share the book around. So. Yeah, Obama's right. Uh, Trump no. is right. Ben Carson is uh, is no. right. Putin is uh, is right. I mean, uh, Abraham uh, uh, al-Baghdadi. Is uh, is right. I mean, orders from all these people. They they must trust them. The Ayatollah Khomeini is right. Yeah, there's everybody's got their uh, their source that they think is right. Now, I don't have any. I wouldn't even call a Kirk right. I would no. say you're right with Yahweh. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the my source of uh, my definition of right. Is Torah prophets. Mm-hmm. Uh, I view Yahweh. Yahweh equals right. Therefore, when I equal Yahweh, I equal right. Yahweh equals light. When I equal Yahweh, I equal light. Yahweh is Torah. If I uh, if I integrate the Torah into my life, then I am right. Yahweh. Yeah. You're a part of. Yes. Part of. Yes. And so the mechanism that the set-apart spirit uses to um, immerse us in her garment of light is she's literally wrapping the Torah around us. Right. Exactly. Yeah. We're putting on the Torah. We're incorporating the Torah into the fabric of our lives. And therefore, and by Torah, don't, don't think we're just talking about five books, folks. We're not. Talking about the totality of Yahweh's Torah, Prophets, and Psalms. It would be what uh, Christians would consider the Old Testament without the Apocrypha, uh, and probably without the Ecclesiastes, and probably without the Song of Solomon. But otherwise, uh, and perhaps without uh, Ruth, um, uh, because those are the ones that don't have prophecy in them, and therefore um, are suspect. But all of the writings, all of the Proverbs, all of the Psalms, the first five books uh, scribed by and, uh, and given through Moshe, uh, the book of Yosha that uh, follows it, and, of course, all of the prophets, uh, big or small, and big or small just means how much uh, prophecy was communicated through them. Yeah, that's... Uh, Habitok is a very small book, but it's uh, by a guy. What a profound. Yeah, profound. For our time. Yeah, profound. Absolutely overwhelmingly profound because it it speaks of the single most important issue of our day. If you could pick one prophetic issue, in fact, really of the last 2,000 years, mm-hmm. what is the single greatest menace to human souls over the last 2,000 years? The, the uh, embracing of Paul. Right. The writings of Paul. Yeah, Roman Catholicism, which became uh, Christianity, is the single greatest menace to humankind 
because it has claimed more souls. It has is, is become, as Yahweh defined it, the plague of death. And it's enabled every other evil. Right. Correct. Now, I wouldn't say that it, it has an exclusive, because Islam, which came um, 600 years later, uh, rabbinic Judaism, which emerged also during this period of time, you know, rabbinic Judaism emerged. Uh, you know, it, it had its beginnings right around uh, 100 BCE, uh, came into its own and uh, really stood out as, uh, as the lone form of Judaism around uh, 133 with Rabbi Akiba, was codified um, at uh, 1000 uh, CE with Maimonides. Uh, and about 500 CE, it, uh, its teachings found their way into the Talmud. It has contributed mightily to uh, the pandemic of the world. As a matter of fact, without rabbinic Judaism, there is no Islam. No socialist secular humanism. Yeah, yeah, there's no socialist secular humanism, and there is no Islam. Yeah. They both grew out of, uh, of, uh, of rabbinic Judaism. Um, so... It has been a, um, uh, but what I was going to say is that the reason that, that the, the criticisms of Paul, which take place throughout the Torah and Prophets, are the single most important prophecy that, that Yahweh gave, is that there is no religion in human history, no doctrine, no human institution in all of re- uh, human history that has been as widespread or as menacing. And so when Yahweh in Daniel, is going through the history of humankind and laying out for Daniel from the point that he is with Babel, confusion, uh, with Baal, the Satan, uh, as he is a, a viceroy in Babel, and he is using um, uh, Gabriel to convey this message because God himself is not going to appear in, um, in Babylon. Uh, nothing associated with Babylon is going to get anywhere near God. And so uh, he was giving him the human history, and he was talking about the beast that would um, deprive humankind of life and of liberty, and of, uh, of, of really of uh, uh, leading people away from it. And he was talking about the very beast of human political and religious, military and economic institutions. And he began with Babel, Babylon, and then went from there to the uh, the median. Uh, Persian Empire and went from there to Alexander the Great. I mean, even telling us that Alexander the Great would die because his internal membranes would rupture, which is exactly how he did die. Uh, and that, uh, and then he goes to uh, how um, Alexander the Great's kingdom would be uh, uh, split up, and then he tells us that uh, it would be conquered by by uh, a beast vastly more vicious mm-hmm. than uh, the Greeks, and that being Rome and that Imperial Rome was the most vicious empire man has ever conceived. And never died. And then he says, but the Imperial Rome, as, a, as the beast, that out of that beast a lowly and little horn will emerge. Oh, the lowly and little one, that would be Paul. That's, the, that's what Paulos means in Latin, uh, Paul's chosen name. And that that lowly and little horn uh, is going to emerge out of the beast that is Imperial Rome, and that it's going to plague the entire world, and it will plague the entire world right until his return. And so what is the doctrine that has plagued the entire world right up to the point of his return? There's only one. Christianity. Right. A religion based entirely on Paul's letters. Right. Entirely. I know that's hard to swallow, but I'm sorry. That's true. Because they're, uh, you know, you you have your uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you have some letters that Paul didn't write. But Paul wrote half of the Christian New Testament, and more than that, when you realize that Hebrews was written by one of uh, Paul's associates, and that and that Luke was written and Acts was written by uh, Paul's uh, uh, attaché, and that uh, Mark was not an eyewitness, and that um, there is very little to validate the independent letters. Um, and you find that what Yosha said, as it's recorded in Matanya and Yaukanan, and uh, what he said in Revelation through, uh, through Yaukanan, is 
wholly and completely negated by Paul's letters. Yes. So there is nothing, Christianity rises and falls entirely on Paul, because it, the religion has almost nothing in common with the words and deeds of Yosha. And so, out of this one man came the greatest plague of death in all of human history. And so, not surprisingly, God has a lot to say about it. This proverb was all about it. Mm-hmm. And he said there's a singular antidote for Paul's rejection of the Torah and its covenant. The terms and conditions of the covenant and the Torah that it's presented in. That's the antidote. That's the magic pill. Absolutely. Yeah. It's the one thing that will make you immune from from Pauline doctrine. And that's all we're going to talk about all of next week. Next week will be our last on shattering this. And all of next week we're going to talk about what we can learn from Yahweh's teaching and guidance that takes us away from the lies of humanity, from human institutions, so that we can engage in a familial and eternal relationship with Yahweh and become light.